with close to 2,000 horsepower estimated and a PB of a 746 at 189 mile an hour, Cody Phillips JZA80 Supra is certainly one to watch here at TX2K. We're here with Cody to find out exactly what makes this car so fast. Now Cody, let's start with the engine. The 2JZ is well known, it's well known for supporting huge amounts of power. But around that 2000 horsepower mark we're starting to see a lot of drag racers now switch across to billet blocks. You're still running a factory cast iron block. Is this a weak point for you? Are you at the limit? I think we're probably at the limit. We're probably approaching that. Um, we only run the car at about 55, 58 pounds of boost, which years ago was a lot, but uh, now people are approaching 70, 80 pounds of boost in this, in this stuff. So uh, I really think that's probably the next uh, revision to do on the car. We're still on a cast block. We're still on IRS. Uh, so those are kind of some of our limits that we know are there right now. Um, I should have probably pointed out there that 746 a lot of our viewers are probably thinking well that doesn't really correlate with 2000 horsepower but the independent rear suspension is uh, a really big factor limiting you, you're on a relatively small tyre. We'll get into that in a bit but just coming back to that engine there, obviously if you really exceed the power limits of the cast iron block you're going to end up with a mess all over the track and uh, pistons and conrods out the side of the block sure. but even below the point where you're actually breaking it uh, do you see any downsides or power limits from the block in terms of uh, does a cast iron block tend to flex and do the bores go out of shape more than a, a, a billet block or is that not really a factor? Well I, I think that's a factor. This car is is really the engine in it now is a 3.2 um, it's a 90 mil stroke aluminum rod um, generally when we run the car um, we run it on the Pro Mod 85, which is what we ran our, our personal best on. We also have a Pro Mod 94, which we run a Texas 2K, but for World Cup Finals, we fit in the Street Fighter class, so we run, we run a Pro Mod 85 on that. Uh, so really, are we stretching that 2000 and really the limits of the, the cast iron block? At that point, no, I would say. But you know, as we want to come out here and sort of take all the weight out of the car that we have to run in Street Fighter, you know, the, and put the 94 on the car, we, we know we're on the edge for sure, just based off of, you know, everybody else in the community and what, what they've been able to do. Now you just mentioned that you're running a 3.2 litre stroker kit in what is obviously conventionally a 3 litre engine and the aluminium rod. Can you just give us a, a little bit of information about where you see the advantages of the alloy rod and a drag application compared to a conventional steel rod? Well, I mean, I, I think it's fairly well documented out there that at certain power levels you're going to need the aluminum rod. It tends to take power better. It tends to be easier on the bearings. Uh, we can also rev the engine a little bit higher that way. And so we do like to rev the engine about 10,000 RPM uh, with the converters that we work with. It, things seem to work really well there. So I really running nitrous, running that much boost in methanol, I, I just don't think a steel rod would ever live through that. So. It, it's really our choice at that point. Downside of course is the fatigue life of the aluminium rods means that you need to replace them. How frequently are you replacing them? Uh, this engine right now only has about, oh, I'd say 30 hits on it now. I'd say we probably are going to change over to something billet before the, the life of the rods are done and we'll probably scrap them at that point and, and start over. But in the past, you know, probably 70, maybe 100 hits at the most at, at lower power levels on the aluminum rods. And, and generally, you take everything apart, it looks okay, but we kind of just scrap them and, and, you know, put a new set in there. So Better safe than sorry. Better than safe than sorry, yeah, talking about all that carnage you were mentioning earlier. So. Right, talking about the rest of the engine package, that bottom end is obviously there really to just support the power and it's the head and the turbocharger that, that's really the key to making the power. Uh, tell us what's done to the cylinder head. Uh, cylinder head is a CNC ported stage 4 Titan head, uh, shimless bucket and we just switched to uh, the GSC methanol cams. So that's a 11.4 mil lift cam. Uh, 294 duration on the exhaust and I believe it's about 278 or so on the intake and really uh, Greg at GSC has kind of profiled that um, and tested that on some other cars in our class to, to really just work best with the methanol to be able to leave that valve open a little longer and, and get some exhaust gases to escape so we, we've gone to that we've we've traditionally ran a half inch head stud in the 2J some guys do some guys don't 
Um, we've had good luck with running that. Uh, so we, we still run an L19 uh, half inch head stud in this package. Uh, really, I think the key is just keeping the cylinder head down. Um, and, and typically on the cast iron block, sometimes you can crack the block as you torque it or apply the power. And, and this is a half filled block, so it's, it's got a little bit of coolant going through the, the block and the head. Um, probably not ideal, especially if you lift the head, you can damage the radiator system. But, um, you know, we, we've typically stayed to that half inch head stud and had some good result with it. So that, that's kind of the top end package, I guess you'd say. Uh, just to go back a little bit there and unpack that, you just mentioned the term half filled block. And uh, just to clarify for, for our viewers who aren't quite aware of, of what that means, can you, can you let us know what you've done there? So to help us strengthen that cast iron block, is we put a, a block hardener in there, or concrete, a lot of people call it, uh, and fill half of the water jacket in there to help support that, the lower part of that cylinder. And, you're torquing everything down, you're applying the boost and all that, it, it just helps add rigidity and strength into it. So just to help uh, eliminate the uh, flex in the sleeves and the liners that you're likely to see at high boost. Exactly. Okay, so now looking at the intake system on the, the engine there, you've got a large plenum chamber and you're obviously going to need a lot of injectors to support the, the fuel flow you need on methanol. When we go to methanol fuel compared to pump gas, we need approximately sort of two and a half times more fuel flow to make the same sort of power. Yes. So what, what injectors have you got fitted there? What is the fuel system? Uh, the fuel system is a mechanical pump. It's a 13 gallon pump from Kinsler. Uh, we fitted it with 12 ID 2000s. Uh, we run our base pressure way up there, so those injectors get pretty happy and flow pretty well up there. Um, and then, you know, typical fuel one-to-one -one regulator, uh, all the lines and stuff to go along with that, but really a big pump and uh, let those injectors just do their thing on the methanol. Now with uh, two injectors per cylinder there, that's a lot of fuel at idle. Are you staging those injectors to allow the engine to start and idle happily? Sure, we, yeah, we stage the injection based off boost and we're just running on six at idle. Okay, uh, with methanol fuel, a lot of drag racers tend to get rid of the intercooler and really there are mixed views on this. You're running a water to air intercooler, so can you tell us why you've gone that way? Well, I just think that w we've, we've ran on ethanol before when we spec the car and we, we've just recently changed to methanol and we figure why not cool the air just, just a little bit more. Um, who knows how high that air temp really is on the other side? We don't have any data on that, but you know, I think any time that you're going to compress the air that much, you're going to heat it, and if you can cool it a little bit before it gets to the, the methanol firing out of all the 12 of those injectors, I think there's some benefit there to, to cooling it a little bit more. It certainly does make sense, and the, uh, the converse argument is that the amount of methanol fuel coupled with its high latent heat of evaporation means that naturally that will be pulling heat out of the air. And then there's the other arguments about the complexity of the, the uh, intercooler system and the added weight, but uh, certainly I don't think there's any clear winner. We see equally fast drag cars on methanol fuel running with and without intercoolers. So yes. in my opinion, really comes down to a bit of a personal preference. Yep. Now, getting all of that power to the rear wheels is obviously the next challenge. Can you tell us what the transmission setup in the car is? So the transmission is uh, M&M two-speed turbo 400. Um, it's got an internal dump valve in it. Uh, we don't run an external dump valve on this particular setup. It's got a uh, Pro Torque torque converter. Uh, we're testing some new stuff for Pro, for Pro Torque on it this weekend, the new U9 system. Um, so th that's pretty much the drivetrain on it. Your typical Turbo 400 has three gears. We run two gears. The, the ratio is really tight, so we don't see a lot of RPM uh, drop on the gear shift. Um, so yeah, that's it, it's a bit atypical to run two in, in the Turbo 400, but you see it a lot in the domestic world, and uh, it seems to be working pretty well for us so far. Yeah, it seems the other competing automatic transmission we often see in drag racing is the two-speed power glide, so you've kind of built yourself a competing uh, Turbo 400? Yeah, I, I think for us, we had a power glide car, and we continued to hurt the power glide and for whatever reason, and we reached out to M&M and talked to Mark Mickey and, and really wanted a a perfect solution and it it went right in the car with the casing and the fitment with just using the two gears didn't have to change the drive shaft length or any of that so we thought yeah we'll, we'll start with this price points a, a touch better 
and uh, you know run a custom ratio and, and and see where that gets us. So we can always go back and put a third gear in it and change a couple things, but for, for now we came from the power glide and the two speed, and this is just a more robust package and, and it fits right in the car, so it, it made sense. Now this is another area that we see a lot of uh, competing opinions with the automatic transmission versus a uh, proper clutchless five-speed drag racing gearbox, maybe a Liberty or a G-Force for example. And of course there are pros and cons of each. Uh, the con for the automatic transmission of course is that you're always going to end up with some converter slip and with a small capacity engine and a big turbo, getting it up on the, uh, the two-step on the start line can be challenging. Uh, of course the uh, downside with a manual gearbox is that you tend to have problems when on the gear shift, unloading the tyres and getting the car to stay hooked up can be a problem. Can you talk about the techniques you're using to get the car to spool the turbo on the start line? So when, when you run all this horsepower on these big pro mods, you need a pretty tight converter. So naturally on a 2J with a small engine, you really need nitrous to bring it up. So we have a, a single fogger dry that we use and, and we spray that on the, on the uh, trans brake to bring it up to the two step and just to give the engine torque is really what we need. And you know, three or 400 RPM before the two-step will turn the nitrous off. And, and you know, we manage all that through the M1 and, and we enrich in the, the nitrous offset with, with the 12 injectors. So it's a pretty simple system. Yeah. Um, we, we also use uh, the internal dump valve on the M&M transmission. And that lets us kind of chill out that torque converter charge pressure uh, so that we don't have to bring up the engine up against such a locked converter and the, the hydraulics of all that. So, you know, the dump valve plays a role in helping it bring it up. Uh, and, and of course, nitrous is instant torque. So it, it kind of s turns the 2J into a bit of a big block for a moment and tends to work really well. In terms of how long it actually takes to, to get up onto the two-step when you come into stage, what sort of time does that take? Generally, when we go full throttle on the trans brake, you want to be up on your two-step in about a second and a half. Uh, so that, that's kind of what we aim for in our data. And, and the Joe, when he works the converter, that's what he wants to see. So. Uh, moving to the rear of the car, you've already mentioned to us that it's an independent rear suspension car. Uh, how much is that a hindrance in terms of your times at the drag strip? Well, it's definitely a hindrance. Uh, you know, we, we can't take advantage of, of the chassis like we could in a, a true four-link setup and, and run any sort of anti-squad or anything like that. So um, it is tricky to get the car down the track. It, it helps to come to 2K and, and World Cup finals because the track prep is so well that I don't think the split on having IRS is quite as bad, but um, it, it, is, it is a disadvantage. It's, it's hard to really hook the car up. Um, it's hard to control the chassis. So, you know, you mentioned the air to water intercooler. That's a bit of weight up front, and, and we need that because um, we have had issues in the past wheeling the cars. We start hitting it harder and harder, and we're on that perfect prep, and, and that 275 radial works really, really well. Plus, we're using nitrous when we leave. So, you know, it's a lot of torque, and, and uh, it can be it can be tough to manage you know really all we have there is shocks and and uh you know sway bar and some basics so all right let's just move into the electronics package and uh, you are a motec dealer so no big surprise there we see the motec brand right throughout the car uh, let us know what you fitted to the car uh so it's a m150 uh it's a dvel box that we have firmware written from john reed on so we work with john on a variety of packages with uh, the super stuff as well as side by sides. So we use that for the ECU and, and we can kind of, anything we dream up, we can kind of make that in the firmware, so that's been great. Uh, we also have a C127 dash. Uh, we do a bit of programming in that for engine protection and whatnot. Uh, PDM15 on this car and uh, yeah, we also have two keypads for it. So we have one for the driver controls and then we have one in the rear. Uh, that we mainly use for the crew and for me as well, but it, it's just nice that we have that back there. We can service the car and run all the, the vital functions as far as fans and water pumps and intercooler pumps and things as we go into, into the pits. Um, Let's just go back and I want to unpack a couple of those those terms you use there for those who aren't aware. So you've got that M150 ECU and you've got the development package or development license for that. So uh, what that means because the M150 ECU is really a universal ECU and it can do whatever you program it to do. That development license allows you in conjunction with John Reed, essentially to write your own firmware to make that ECU do whatever you want it to do. So uh, that's one aspect there and in terms of the functionality 
of the ECU that you and John have developed for drag racing. Uh, can you give us a, a couple of examples maybe of what you're doing there? So some of the key things I think are, uh, we use the CO2 boost control that's built in. So that, that's, that's in GPR and some of the other packages, but we find it very effective to basically target wastegate pressure and just, just hit that. Uh, the, the system is very good at, at hitting target for that. Uh, we also want to try and, and build that into our boost aim. So as we just aim for a manifold pressure, uh, for intake pressure, you know, down the road, just be able to say, hey, we're on 50 pounds and just hit that based off the, the wastegate feedback and, and play EMAP and things in, in, into it as well. So, so in, in terms there, instead of at the moment targeting a specific boost pressure in the inlet manifold, which is obviously ultimately what we want to achieve, what you're actually doing is controlling the CO2 pressure reaching the wastegate. So the ECU is able to do that incredibly accurately uh, within about a quarter of a PSI, I think you told me off camera. Yes. And then as a result of that, there's an indirect correlation between the wastegate pressure or CO2 pressure in the top of the wastegate and ultimately how much boost pressure you get in the inlet manifold and you're working towards developing that relationship so you can just target a boost pressure, you'll get a specific pressure in the wastegate and everything's going to work perfectly. Correct, yeah. And and I think the, the key about the M1, especially with DVEL, is it, it, it can do anything. We have a, a, a bump box type of system built into the trans brake. We can also use that to creep into the lights or we can do just a, a traditional bump. So we don't need a separate box for that. We don't need a separate CO2 boost control system. We don't need a separate nitrous control system. So a, a lot of times I think the, you know, the stigma about MoTeC is the price point in that. But when you <laughs> compare it up against the capability of those things and you don't need all these other boxes and you can do all the logging and all that, it, it becomes a, a simple choice in my opinion. So. Uh, also, another aspect that's quite commonly used in drag racing is traction control. Can you tell us how you're employing traction control in the car? Basically, uh, you know, when you use front versus rear wheel speed in the uh, traditional sense, as you apply that to a torque converter car, obviously when you let off the trans brake, the RPM will skyrocket up and, and, and really the front wheel is not moving at all, so the computer's gonna think that it's slipping. So we basically can profile the drive shaft speed and have a, a traction control strategy up against that. So it's essentially a passive style of traction control? Yeah. All right, the uh, other product that you talked about there was the PDM15, which is a power distribution module. So this is replacing our traditional fuses and relays. Can you just tell us a little about what you're doing with that and how it works? Really, it, it just runs all the electronics on the car, powers everything up. The good thing about a PDM is no no fuses. Uh, you don't need to use switches. We use the keypads. Uh, we have some mechanical switches going into it, but no fuses, no relays. Uh, you know, just solid state electronics. You don't have to rattle anything out when you're going down the track, and easy to troubleshoot. Uh, there's, there's systems in there that if something shorts, it'll retry the circuit, or if a fuel pump fails, you can turn on another one, or you know, and you can get really, really detailed with the programming. Uh, I use a lot of counter features in the PDM uh, to to turn boost control up and down, or adjust launch RPM on the line, um, or adjust the the creep or the bump box in the, in the firmware. So um, it, it's really not just only powering things up, but couple that with the keypad. Uh, just gives you the driver a ton of, of functionality where he can make a change right before he goes down the track and not have to pull out a, a laptop or something to, to, to make that change. So. A, a lot smarter logic than you can ever fit into a relay and a fuse. For sure, yeah, and, and it really comes down to the programming of the system and, and that's where the capability comes in. I think another function that's easy to overlook is the ability to data log all of the currents and loads on every channel out of that power distribution module. So it makes it a lot easier. As you sort of alluded to there, if something does go wrong, you've got all of that data to, to diagnose exactly why you're seeing that problem. Look, Cody, it's an amazing car, and uh, we've seen there's a lot of work gone into it. Looking forward to seeing how you go this weekend. Thanks for the chat. Okay, thank you. Good to meet you. that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed we release a new video every week and if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you 
click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.